the Lord saying, my remnant, that 1%, those who seek me in spirit and truth, hear my voice, follow my commandments, heed to the word of God, follow those things that have been set before them. Those who come in agreement in heart, in prayer, in mind, and soul. Those people, that 1%, will know the glory. The Lord says those will be the ones who will be healed. Those will be the ones that will be taken up. Those will have their hearts healed. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Praise God. That was a really nice comeback, David. <laughs> Wow, did anybody just see what happened here? Did anybody see that angel right there? Did you? Oh, he saw it. All right. Praise God. Hi, Bill. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Praise God. I'm taking my shoes off, guys. Well, we're missing folks, but you know what? It's, we have been in flat out warfare all week. How's it? You guys been in warfare? I, 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 fig I figure that's why the Kellys are here. Either Jesus is going to be coming back. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the warfare, you know, I've been praying. And, and there's two kinds of warfare. There's the warfare that you go through that you're acknowledging. And you're seeing the warfare happening. And so you're resisting it. And then there's a warfare that's attacking you. And you just accept it and walk with it. Right? And too many people walk with their warfare. Majority of people. You guys don't know, understand what I got. I got a really bad leg cramp. <laughs> and you know, we've been struggling for the last six months with the sound system here. And this this is going next door too, guys. Don't worry. And the sound system, the the devil's busy, right, David? Yeah. So. But you know what? We're leaving them over here. Yeah. Well, actually not here. He can, he, can leave. He, he, can, he can go out in the parking lot. I can't explain how much battle we've been in just for the certificate of occupancy. Last week I walked in to the office to get the, you know, for, the, the guy came over to inspect the building next door and rejected us. And then the numbers didn't match. And he said, well, you have to go down there and talk to him. So they had to do a whole architectural drawing of the space next door, literally on the other side of the wall. And it said that we were allowed to have 333 people, and the sign said 250. And I went down there, and they said it was 174. I'm like, ha, geez. Lord, i got to fix this. And so we couldn't go in there. And last weekend, we got the, half the building painted. And, you know, we're, we're just sitting here on high idle, burning gas. And, and so uh, they were supposed to fix this last week. Well, they procrastinated all week. And yesterday, the, the lady came out, did the architectural drawing. I said, look, we're a church. And if you can get this done ASAP, I might be able to get this to the city tomorrow, which was today, and get our, our permit. And so this morning at 9 o'clock... I get the text message from the landlord saying, well, here's the paper. You need to go down to the city. And I, I called her up. I said, <clears throat> what? <laughs> I said, number one, the paper, what size of paper is it supposed to be on? Oh, 11 by 18, the big paper. I said, I don't have a printer like that. She goes, well, we do at our office. I go, well, number two, it's your responsibility. It's your building. You're supposed to go down there and take care of it. That's your thing to remedy. Number three, I'm about five minutes away from calling the attorney on this whole mess. Well, an hour and a half later, guess what? We had the paper in our hand. Well, that was part one paper. Part two, I had to go down there, reschedule the occupancy where the uh, inspector comes out and give them $120 so they can come out on Saturday... And my first question was, could he possibly come out today? Oh no, he has to come out on Saturday. So I had to give them $129. And since it's the city, uh, they charge a 2.9% penalty for using a charge card because they didn't have a check. Okay, so it was uh, $125. 
So I give him that, and an hour and a half later, we get a phone call from the inspector. He goes, I don't want to work on Saturday. Can I come over and inspect the building? <laughs> and so we got, our, we got our certificate. We got our certificate. And then uh, Brett, give Brett a hand. He's been fixing. I, 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 didn't, I, I couldn't tell him what to do, hypothetically, because we weren't supposed to move, do certain things, but he snuck it all over there anyway. All right. <laughs> and there's pizza in the refrigerator over there if you guys are hungry. And so we went through this entire battle, and we're still going through battles. And so uh, at 4 o'clock today, we got the certificate of occupancy, and it's not 179 or 174. Now, one of the inf infringement infractions, we didn't have our suite number on the building, which is 300. They came back and said we can have 300 people next door. That means if we have full-blown revival and we're packed like sardines, I don't think we can get 300 in there anyway. So we have unlimited, they'll be out in the parking lot kind of thing. So on Sunday, it's going to be a little bit different. We'll have our regular service at 2 for the, the, the Korean church. And... Um, we got the sign guy coming next week because we couldn't even put the sign up because of the, the city. Uh, we didn't, you know, step by step. And so we're going to go over there with the, without the worship. We'll ha we may have the worship team if I, I can talk them into it. But at 1030, we're going to start Pentecost. We're going to pray over it. Actually, Pentecost starts tomorrow night at sunset. How many people knew that? Okay. We're going to shift into a different season and when I come back from Minnesota in two weeks I'll have probably all that training material in Mandarin. We got, we got a great paint job. We're getting Wednesday carpet. So pretty much everything's going to look pretty nice. And our last thing, pray for the chairs. We got to figure out what we're going to do with the chairs. We have folding chairs and everything but I'm excited. We've waited 18 months, and we've had so much warfare the last seven months. It's just been ridiculous. We had a point in time where we had, what, four or five people get injured. Multiple car accidents. This is just ridiculous, and it's all the devil, and we got people praying. And tonight, we're missing three or four families right now, but um, right off the top of my head. But you've got to have to understand, when we have transition, when you're going up the mountain... You may feel like you're going in a circle, but you're actually going up higher. And we have to realize what we're dealing with right now is we're going into a whole new season, spiritually as a country, what we're, what we're seeing right now as a country, this, you know, it, it, it's, it's stressful. So let's, let's turn to Numbers, and we're starting our Parsha reading this week, and we're in Numbers, and uh, we've been doing, the, we got the book out there in the car, I didn't bring it in, Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. And, you know, Kenneth Hagin wrote that book. Jesus came to him um, in the middle of the night and spoke to him. And he literally wrote that book in one night. And it's a powerful book. Uh, we have in Korean, English, and Spanish. Si como no. And, and we're seeing this. We're in Numbers 345. And we, if you don't know where you're going, why are you moving your feet? Seriously. There's so many people trying to do something. It's not their plan. It's not their purpose. But we, we get into the numbers, and every week we do our Parsha reading. And it says, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites, and the Levites shall be mine. I am the Lord. And if you want to read verse four, uh, 46, kind of tied to it. And for the ransom of the 273 of the firstborn of the sons of Israel who are in the ex, uh, ex excess beyond the Le Levites. There's a level of people in Israel that came out of Egypt. And I'm not going to get into arguments about who they were. I, the Lord told me to put on my white tali. Did anybody notice I got my silver tali on? The, the David David broke whatever he did. We broke through tonight. We had a, a nice little breakthrough. But Israel coming out of Egypt, there was still a hierarchy. They were in the land of Goshen, and at at the time when they came out of Goshen, 
the, a lot of the folks were still worshiping uh, Osiris and uh, or is it Horus? Osiris or Horus? It could, however, you, it could be either way. And so they saw this Le Levitical priesthood that these people were actually part of the twelve tribes, and they were into idol worship in the Egypt. But what happened was when they went into the desert after the Passover they came into the desert and during this 40 day period there was a selection process that God made and we saw the tribes go up the hill and it actually it was a tribe of Jashar and then after, after ja you saw Joshua go up halfway up the mountain and then Moses went all the way up in the mountain those people saw the bottom, the tribe of uh, Ishakar, I'm sorry, I said Jasher, Ishakar saw the bottom of heaven when they came down on the mountain. The Levites took the place of all the tribes because there was so much confusion. Everything was broken up in little tribal, tribal sects and everything. And I was listening today. Uh, a, a gentleman was substituting on the radio for, some, uh, for a national speaker and they were talking about the situation with the Taliban and the Middle East and how the tribes come together and the tribes forge each, each other. I don't know if you heard that today, but this guy, he was really breaking down how the tribal committees would select the leadership. And what God did was wipe all that out, all the politics, and said, look, you guys are the firstborn." of Israel. You're the Levites. You're the priests. You're the headship of Israel, period. Like it or not. Like it or not. The words in the text are almost identical to the verse 41. If you slide up there, and you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord in, uh, instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel and the cattle instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the sons of Israel. So th there is a whole shifting of preference how we think. It went from, well, I'm going to sacrifice what I need, to the point that there was a community that came together, and there was a headship. We are the body of Christ. Christ is the headship. He's not a Levite. He comes from a higher order of Melchizedek. In the place of every firstborn of Israel... There is a, a d distinctly a reminiscent verse. I, sh I hereby take the Levites among the Israelites in place of all firstborn. The people that are put in leadership in the church systems are required to follow certain things. Hello? You can throw stuff at me. Everybody's silent. Either I'm good or you guys are in shock. And that when it says to take, it means that God took these guys, set them apart, made, made them holy. Kadosh. Holy. And so as, as we, we get into prayer tonight, and we start understanding that the firstborn of the family are usually the leaders. And you see this in every culture around the world. The oldest son gets everything. How many people know that? That's a cultural, that's a cultural thing. Why is that? There's a burden placed on that person to perform, actually, in the body of Christ in, as, 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 as in headship. The leadership, this is the thing with leadership, has to take, not only be the leader, but has to take the responsibility as well as the authority. Most people in leadership want the authority, but not the responsibility. They don't want to do the dirty work. And this is why, I, I'm telling you, I, I, been, I, I was in management for 35 years. I don't look that old. Seriously. At one point, I supervised 2,000 employees. And you know people by their works and who's working and everything, and you have to have relationships with these people. And years ago, when I, I owned the Carl's Jr.'s Hamburgers, well, actually it was when I had my, our first Japanese restaurant, the Lord spoke to me in the back of a converted Kentucky Fried Chicken about growing restaurants and I ended up six years later owning I had six Carl's Juniors well that was pretty decent I mean that, that's, I was batting a thousand and then years later I was I was supervising 
sit, uh, during that time I was with Carl's Jr., 42 restaurants. And that's before we had computers and all this stuff. I, I memorized all the phone numbers. I had, I, it's just kind of like, you know, this Rain Man thing I had going on. It was really bad. And I, I ended up, you know, just, you, you learn to work with people. So people that are in leadership have to follow a status quo that was set up by God. There's only one way to do it. And, and I talked to the, our leadership, and the leadership just continually goes back and forth to the, the responsibility. And in this leadership of the firstborn, is tied to intercession. Intercession. Because the leadership's always the headship. The headship's always praying, and it trickles down. This is what last week when I was teaching how Jesus was interceding for you. He went up to the right hand of God. He sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's giving you utterance. He's praying through you. You have the Father who's also up there interceding. You have everybody interceding for you. And then you come, t come back to earth. Who are you praying for? And we're going to walk through that tonight because the, who you're supposed to be praying for is the leadership. Now, I'm not going to get in politics, but I'm going to explain something about politics. The reason we're in, we have who we have is because the people in the pulpit's not teaching what is godly. Period. Did anybody see what they did yesterday in Canada? They legalized bestiality. Holy smoke. They legalized bestiality in Canada. In Canada. Canada. Where? The whole country. No, 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 no. Not just Ottawa. <laughs> I, I never did understand Ottawa. <laughs> but the whole country. That's at, at, at a national level. And when we start condoning sin, there's going to be a backlash. And this is, we're, we have, we're a multicultural church here. The only people, we, we, you know, we're missing some folks tonight. We got probably four more languages out there and they're not here. But we have to start realizing how to pray for our country, especially in this time. And I've been going through, I, I, I do my devotions. I, I'm not doing, I'm not copying Kenneth Hagin. I've read, I read the book and I'm praying and God gives me what to put on, come up here and talk about. And, but one of the things I saw in one of his videos is he was talking in 1987 about the election that was coming up. And he said, and he was going through this whole situation why we're in trouble back then. Oh, no, it was 80, it was for the, it must have been 89 because he was praying for the 90 election. And what's going to happen if we don't do this? And I'm going to tell you this. Since probably 1900, since the birth of the Pentecostal movement, we've been on a backsliding nation. Period. You know, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, 100 years ago, there was a woman that ran for president and she was elected the leader of her uh, party. Did anybody know that? I can't think of the lady's name. So the politics, and she was a Christian lady too. She wasn't one of these far out. But one of the things that's happening in the politics of the church is reflecting the politics of the system. And this is how the devil is going to use a one world order by confiscating the church, putting, you know, in, in Italy, they, they were told in Italy, in the churches in Italy, not to pray out loud to Jesus because it offends the Muslims that are refugees inside their churches. Well, those folks have already been captive. They're already captive. Our revolutionary war started, there's no king but King Jesus. And so the leadership we have to pray for, we have to learn how to pray. And I'm a, we're going to get into some teaching about Praying for leadership, the intercession. Because you can't go any place unless we have favor or the people in charge are going in one direction. How many people remember John Boehner? Did you notice something happened back in September? The Pope came over. That's my Pope move. The Pope came over. 
Yeah, you like that? That's my pulp move. I, he, he, used to, he, he was a sideshow. He came over and handed the baton from John Boehner. He was crying. John Boehner was crying. Oh, look at the pulp. Oh. And handed the keys from Catholic John Boehner to Catholic Paul Ryan. Did anybody notice that? You know how many Catholic people are actually in, uh, Republicans? There's about two. So, how do the Pope de Jure, you like that? I always like that one, Pope de Jure, the Pope of the day, shift our whole Congress or Senate over in, into that Pope land? There's something stinks in France. And we are going to be victims. So we have to learn to pray strategically, pray ahead, and we're going to go through some of the scripture. First of all, John Wesley, he said, God is only limited by our prayer life. People aren't praying. And we were in worship and the Holy Spirit was talking to me and he explained, you know, this year I'm praying, I'm, I, I'm, I, we got over 100 people baptized in the Holy Spirit this year already. Okay? I'm going to New York in two, three weeks. I'm going to uh, a week and a half or two weeks. I'm going to Minnesota. And we're, we're having, we're, we're, we're bringing them in, but we need to keep them in the chairs. When people get spirit filled, they can pray out God's will. Period. We're praying out the mysteries of God. It says when we're praying in the spirit, we're talking to God. John Wesley said, God is limited by our prayers. And if you don't have something, we're not praying. But we're, we're going we're gonna to bring it together here. Uh, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I, 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 I was just amazed when David pulled that off. I, I was so happy. Thank you. Uh, th this is the, our last official service here and um, we're in 1st Timothy chapter 2 oh my fingers are sticky 1st Timothy chapter 2 1 through 3 first of all okay that works then I urge that it, that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be, ma be made on behalf of all men for kings of all who are in authority in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of our, God's, our, 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 our God, our Savior. Now let's read verse 4. Oh, well, no, no, not yet. We need to be praying for our country, the leadership of our country. We need to be praying for the leadership of our state. We need to be praying for the leadership of our church, our churches. We need to, our church specifically because we're here. And the households, the fathers. Everything that we do in the Passover, the word Seder means order. There's an order of events and there's also a, a headship and a sequence of events. And Pastor Pam and I, we, we were talking about this uh, quite often lately, how things are set up in the body of Christ. And the problem is we're coming into a revival time and we have first generation people that don't have a foundation of Christ and they're using what they're learning in the socialistic atmosphere that they've been raised in and they're coming into the church system expecting certain things to happen. We literally have a Cisco and Hebert mentality that something's good or something's bad. They don't know what's going on over on this side of the category. On this side of the fence. They don't know what's going on with the leadership. The good news is the leadership of this church is praying for you guys. And we're getting, we're getting, a, uh, we're getting breakthroughs and attacks. Almost every breakthrough we've had in the last month, we've had to ram that door two to three or four times until it's broken down. And we have to start praying in that tenacity because th this, is, this is the purpose of praying for leadership. Because we read one, uh, 1 Timothy uh, 2, 1 through 3. We pray for the leadership so that, here's the result, verse 4, whose, 
God our Savior, whose desires are all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is only one, for there is one God, one mediator, also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. Remember, God, we were talking about plans and purposes. There's a purpose why we have to do certain things. Well, you know, I don't like... Uh, how many people saw that uh, post on Facebook about the Filipino church who are sitting in the church and it's flooded up to the knees? And I put, I put down, oh, I wonder if they... What, you know, wonder if they, their guests are trying to figure out what color the carpet is. You know, they're sitting in church, it's packed, and you know, there's probably snakes and stuff too. I mean, it's just like, you know, Pastor Pam's going to the Philippines. But, you know, just imagine sitting in the chairs, coming to service, and your, your, your feet are in water 18 inches deep. They're hungry for God. And these people that criticize the leadership, they don't realize what it takes to put the service and keep the church going. I spent two hours with the IRS the other day on the phone. I was like, when I got off the phone, I just wanted to snap. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. And, and we got down to the point where I'm begging them, give me the first time grace. And they said, oh, we can't do that because you misfiled in 2013. It's like, what do you mean we misfiled? We got everything filed. Well, there's an error someplace and we can't correct it on our side. It's like, how many accounts have we got out there? One, two. <laughs> we got a couple. Of, so, I'm, I'm, have you ever had these phone calls with the IRS, Josh? You've never talked to the IRS. All right, I'll let you next time. <laughs> but proper prayer for leadership brings salvation. What does it say right there? Proper prayer for leadership will bring salvation. We all have this critical spirit we're fighting because we're being attacked all the time, so we turn around with the counterattack. Pastor Pam, is that what that says there, if you read 1 through 6? That's pretty much what it says. If you're praying for the leadership, regardless of your opinion of them, you know, and, and, and it's, it's funny that there's buzz terms that are used in the political circles that are used when somebody doesn't like somebody. But when they're on the same team, they're great. But when they get pushed out of the team, they're something else. We do that in the body of Christ, and we've got to stop that. The proper prayer will bring intercession. Intercession, what it says there, intercession and thanksgiving opens doors for salvation and the healing of a nation. When you start looking at the Wesleyan revival and some of these historical revivals, literally, towns were taken over, bars were shut down, the house of ill repute, I would like that word, the houses of ill repute, were shut down. You know, it's really bad when the hookers go out of business. Hey! That's, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> so we have to understand that the leadership of the church is under attack let's go to Romans and this is, this is a theme throughout the New Testament and, it, and, and it's going to bleed back down into the Old Testament let's go to Romans 13 1 through 6 and 13 it says let every person in subjection uh oh who's in subjection here every one of us let me explain something. I'm under two ministerial coverings. The Full Gospel Fellowship, which covers our church, which where the Full Gospel businessmen came out of, and AFCM, which is under Jim Caseman, which is under Rama. I mean, that's, that's pretty laminated. It's pretty good stuff. But we're under a, sec a subjection to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Why is the leadership in leadership currently is because we didn't pray. Well, it just says, well, God put them in leadership. Well, because you didn't pray. You didn't ask. And we need to be asking for godly people to do godly things. 
I saw a thing yesterday about the abortion that it's every 30 seconds in the United States there's abortion. Every 30 seconds. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, years and years and years and years. 60 million people have been killed in the United States since 1973. And Roe versus Wade could have been overturned by Jane Roe, who became a Christian and said she was forced to do this, and they never let her go up there and contest her own findings. She was the only person that could have done that, and they wouldn't have let her do that. Just a little FYI. Verse 2, Therefore he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and when they who are opposed will receive condemnation themselves. For the rulers are not a curse of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have fear of authority, or do you want to do what is good? And you will have praise in the same. For it, is not, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil and be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God. An avenger who brings the wrath upon the one who practices evil. I'm, I'm just overwhelmed seeing this stuff on the internet. How many people have seen this naked praise and worship leader that was on Hillsong. That Mario Murillo. Did, he, did you see that? This guy was up there in the guitar with, I, I think he had Daisy, Daisy Dukes, a man with Daisy Dukes on, playing guitar. Huh? Underwear? Up on the stage, dancing, and, and, and you, know, you know, well, you know, David danced in his underwear. That was David. <laughs> This is, how, this is how extreme the church is getting. And w this is why I believe the Lord's going to give us revival because we're going to bring some stuff down to earth. Verse 5. Wherefore it is necessary to be in a subjection not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience sake. Come on, guys. You're up there in your underwear. For because of this you will also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God devoting themselves to these very things. If you are in evil, with evil thoughts, you're going to open the door for the devil to put more burdens on you in the government. Does that make sense? Is that what's happening? We start combating the stuff that's in the leadership in the church and the number one issue in the church is people understanding the authority of the, the pastor, the setup of the, the scriptures, we're coming into uh, Pentecost, you know, and, and what's, what, what happens is here we are, we're studying the Word of God tomorrow night, and we have to put it in the application. If we can't put it in the application, we're, we're not going to have our breakthrough. And, uh, you know, in the, in, we're going to get into some of this other scripture, but, you know, I, I'm blessed every time I see the gray hair. I'm not, I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about the really old people out there. You know, I, I follow Pastor Stan in Virginia on Facebook. And they're in their 80s. And, and you know what? They are like my spiritual parents. These people were Assembly of God pastors for 50 years. If you could live and be a pastor for 50 years, there's, you've got something going on that I need. And, and, you know, so they're just blessed people. But the, the gossiping, those things that are coming in here, but the accepting of evil and the tolerance of evil. And so when we, we get into how we're handling the leadership, you know, for seven years, eight years of our ministry here, I worked two jobs full time. And people are going, when are you going to go ministry full time? I go, I already am. We were, I, the last year, I've been able to get some rest. I was working 60 hours a week, running Yeshua House. We did not, I did not miss a day. Did, it, did you mean, never, never. Supernatural, never get sick, praise God. Miss a day. We built the ministry. We had attack after attack. The anointing, the devil's after the anointing. We've had many people get healed, many people saved. But the understanding what it takes to keep the church on the map. That's what people have to respect. And this is where we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have to talk about that tonight. Let's go to Psalms. 
uh, 105, verse 15. Psalms 105, verse 15. It says, Do not touch my anointed ones or do harm to my, uh, or do my prophets no harm. I don't say this publicly. Most people just recognize that actually I'm a prophetic minister. Not only am I a prophetic minister, I'm a prophetic evangelist. And it's apostolic. So being a pastor, I don't want to say it's out of my realm. It's not my forte. <laughs> and so I do a lot of prayer. You know, I was talking to Pastor Pam today. We do a lot, I do a lot of prayer, listening prayer. Listening prayer. It has to be strategic. And we have to learn to pray in the spirit and hear God's voice and do these things. But the alignment comes when we start recognizing who's in authority and what's in authority. And when we have people that are out of authority and I confront them and people get mad at me, hey, I'm sorry. And, and when something's not right or unjust, I'll stand my ground. I have that tenacity... I like the word righteous indignation. It says, do not touch my anointed ones. I was not, I didn't decide when I was a little weak boy, growing up, hiding in the shadows of people, thinking, well, I can just hide in church for the rest of my life and make a career out of it. I wasn't like that. I'm sorry. We're running and gunning. God called me into this. I'm sincere. This is a calling. I'm here because we were called. Yeshua House was established because it's a called ministry. It's being established. People watch us. And God's here. Jesus is here. The anointing's here. And there's a purpose for this ministry beyond what anybody sees. And I still don't understand it. If it's end time revival, we will do it. But do not do my prophets harm. When somebody comes up and says, well, you know, well, this prophecy is good, that prophecy is bad. You know, I, you know, they get the Cisco, Cisco Hebert, thumbs up, thumbs down. Well, I like this guy, I don't like that guy. If somebody's telling you the truth, and somebody's, been up, somebody's up here on this side of the line, facing that way, listen to them. They're not here to yank your chain just to yank your chain. If it's something sincere, please listen. Let's go to uh, 1 Chronicles 16. And we're, we're seeing a pattern here of prayer, intercession, leadership. 1 Chronicles 16, 16 through 20. This is actually... A praise song of David. I don't know if anybody has that in their caption. The covenant which, is, which he made with Abraham, his oath to Isaac, he also confirmed to Jacob for a, a statute. That means an everlasting covenant. It will not change. That includes the holidays, the word of God, the commandments of God, to Israel, an everlasting covenant Verse 18, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance when they were only a few in numbers, very few, and strangers in it. And they wandered about from the nation to nation, from one kingdom to another kingdom. He permitted no man to oppress them, and he, re, he, he, reapproved, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, do not harm my prophets. And there's God is dealing with nations and leadership when people are interceding. When it says chosen ones, it's just not the Israelites. When you accepted the Messiah of the David, or excuse me, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the, the God, when you've accepted Christ the Messiah, you became a chosen one. Period. It's not a, hey, great idea, I understand this. No, you're a part of the chosen people. You're a royal nation now. The, but the prayer 
If you go through this, you'll see this common denominator, even in Psalm 51, you'll see this common denominator that, that we need to pray for our enemies. God's going to shift them over at some point in time. You accepted Christ and became a poor, part of that royal nation. You became a righteous person. During Yom Kippur, you know, everybody know Yom Kippur? The Day of Atonement, at Yom Kippur, one of the prayers that Israel prays is that they pray for the 70 nations. They pray for everybody who is not saved. They want everybody. We want everybody to know Jesus before he comes back. We don't want anybody left behind based on the fact that they weren't trained, you weren't trained, and that there's no power there. People will come to the power of God when they see it released. And there's too many people out there in the witchcraft. Now, the, the chicken head lady. Hello, pastor. The chicken, did you, I saw her tonight. Did you see her? I almost got her with my car. We had somebody last year during the high holiday throw a dead bird at our door. Well, that's witchcraft. And I, and I almost got her with my car. <laughs> oh, come on guys. one person smiling okay two people smiling this lady cut the head off a bird she's in a witchcraft ripped the head off and threw it at the, at the door of our church so there's people out there practicing witchcraft and I'm going to tell you this every culture has a form of witchcraft not only every culture has a form of witchcraft there's different kinds of witchcraft between men and women did anybody hear that? Mm -hmm. There's different kinds of witchcraft that we practice between ourselves and having the Bible, the scripture in front of us, segregates us from the witchcraft. It separates us from the witchcraft. It tells you how you, if you're old, I don't want to say, a mature woman. <laughs> hey, <laughs> how's that? Is that a little better? If, if you're a mature person, how to treat the younger people? Exhort them. I like that word. Exhort them. They're going to exhort you. And you, you need to be lifted up in the point where you're trained so you can become a mature old lady with a godly continence. How's that? Is that okay? I, you can handle it? <laughs> that witchcraft that's out there is it coming into the church and we don't know how to defend ourselves. The only way we can defend ourselves is by praying in the Spirit, breaking those things off, standing our ground, and making sure that people know that they have a role and they follow that role. We had, we had a young man a couple years ago wanted to help with the children. And I said, no. I said, no. He, well, I want, I, want to, I want to be with the kids. I go, well, go get married and have some kids. Right? Hey, just wait. You, you know what? You go home, you get married, you have three kids. You don't want to go to church and babysit the kids anymore. <laughs> right? Get a job. Take care of your family. McFly. Let's go to... So the intercession comes at the level where we start praying for people and we change our attitudes. We change who we are. And you come out of your culture. Remember I've said this a million times. If your culture is stronger than your Christianity, you're in a cult. Amen. But how do I know I'm still thinking like the old person? When somebody with gray hair tells you, Sonny, you need to move over into this other lane. You need to cut the pass off. You need to go forward. You need to repent. You need to shift. That's when you know you've got to do something. Let's go to Genesis eighteen twenty three. Even at the beginning of the covenant of Abraham, we see Abraham interceding for a city. And remember, these cities were nations. And um, Genesis eighteen twenty. And the Lord said, "The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great." Their sins extreme, exceedingly grave. We're doing that stuff here. I mean, I mean, the the the, the thing with the, the babies, you know, 
and, and, and you know, it's just there's so much sick stuff out there. It's just ab- it's just absolutely sick. And and these 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 people have to, you have to realize almost every culture in the Old Testament had some form of baby killing. Every every culture baby f- killing the firstborn. They did it. Verse verse twenty one. Uh, oh, let's start. Let's phew, let's start up verse sixteen. Then the uh, men rose up from there, looked down towards Sodom. Abraham was walking with them uh, to send them off, and Abraham and, and he was talking. He, he, his faith was being tested. And the Lord said, to him, "I shall hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, and since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, in him all nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him in order that." Uh, he may command his children, his household, after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteous and justice in order that the Lord may bring up Abraham, bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. That's all the blessings. Verse 20, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is exceedingly grave. Abraham was righteous. I'm not rewriting history. It's not in the Bible. But Abraham knew God from a child. He didn't just, hear, at 70 years old, wake up one day and say, Oh, I heard the Lord. He, he spent his childhood with Shem. His father was a high priest with Terah. Tehran. That's where he came out of Earl of, uh, Ur of Chaldean. That's out of Iran, Iraq. But the promise of Abraham had to do with righteousness. Abraham prayed for Lot. Now, if you read different scripture, Lot wasn't participating in this. Now, in Islam, they said Lot was actually righteous because he was an evangelist for God. The debate started when God was speaking and Abraham came up to God and said, God, 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 you got to stop this. Don't blow them up. There's some righteous people in there. And God goes, well, show me 50. Show me 10. Five, two. I thought it was three. Is it two? Three. I think it gets down to three. And it gets down to there's just a couple. But because there's a righteous person praying, God will hold up a nation. I believe there is some potential for the United States still. We haven't gone to hell in a handbag yet. There's some fancy handbags out there, folks. Abraham's prayer for Sodom and Gomorrah prevented the righteous to be destroyed. What is righteous? When you accept the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you accept the Messiah, Yeshua, Hamashiach. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior that shifts you out of sin into a righteous state. You are in right standing with God because you've repented. And that's why this is so critical before we go into the new building. We're going to do a little repentance tonight. We're going to have a little prayer time. I wish everybody was here tonight. Prayer can change things. And it's not based on a number number of people. It's not based on a number of people. Well, well, we need 10,000 people praying that little girl get healed. How how many people have ever seen that? And there's a story, I, years ago I heard Kenneth Hagin, I know, you don't want to hear Kenneth Hagin. Great story, great story. Because the thing is, you know what, I'm going to tell you what I like about the man. He walked through the basic steps to understand how things work. Once you understand how things work, then they will work for you. There was a pastor who got sick with cancer and they had thousands of people praying for this pastor. Thousands, thousands of people was praying. And everybody was praying for this pastor. Oh, oh, oh. And everybody was praying. Then one day, the pastor changed his mind about healing and decided, well, I want to get healed. I'm going to have to accept this and walk in it. And guess what happened? He got healed. We deal with people that don't want to change their minds. They're stuck in their culture, their mindset. That's the problem in the church. And so when we pray... We also have to explain stuff. We need to walk through some of this teaching so when you're here praying and, and somebody says, hey, we're, we're in a different mode tonight. We're in a repentance mode. 
This is between you and God tonight. This is not between, you know, well, you know, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to pray for it. No, 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 no. This is going to be a little bit different because we're going into a new place and we do not need that luggage following us. Not everybody's here. Well, I understand that. But guess what? The righteous are here. Everybody here is saved. Almost all you are spirit filled. I believe you are. And that God's going to use that righteous stuff, the faith of those people, to break through. The principles of prayer and intercessions are throughout the entire Bible. There are 42 verses that actually direct you to pray for one another or the leadership. Almost every book in the Bible is a direct, hey, you need to pray for one another and pray for leadership. So when you start praying in the morning, yes, you need to pray for yourself, but that shouldn't be your priority. You know, you could pray all day to be Superman, and you go outside there and there's a bigger storm than you are. You need the authority, the covering of the leadership of your country, of your state, of your family, of your church, to help you grow in the right direction. Is this new stuff or old stuff? That leadership needs to be held up and every word spoken against leadership hurts you. And this is why I don't like people that criticize other ministries. There are some ministries that are out there that are just way off. You know, somebody up there, the, the, they call them the naked cowboy. That's wrong. There's some things that are obviously wrong. Right? Obviously wrong. But, you know, when people start attacking, well, Joyce Myers, you know what? I've seen, I seen people, I, I, I've met the lady. I, I've, she came to our store. We had 900 people. We, any, anybody come to that? When we, she came to my store? 900 people. Every one of the testimonies, she helped me. And she's under alignment of her husband. She does not do anything without her husband's permission. Seriously. And her family's in order. And those, there's blessings coming. And she's teaching those principles to the next generation and the women are getting healed and their families are being stabilized. So people, well, she's making so much money. People send her hundreds of thousands of dollars because she has orphanages all, all around the world and she's not wasting money. Kenneth Hagin, whoa, Kenneth Hagin. Hey, you know what? If you're doing what God tells you to do, you'll be blessed. Abraham was rich. Job was rich twice. Hello? If you're doing what God's telling you, he's going to bless you because he trusts you with his money. He's going to trust you with this. And so when we follow certain things, the statutes, God's going to take care of us. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles. We're, in a, we're coming around the corner here. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. How many people ever dealt with Joyce Myers about put, pushing the shopping cart away? <laughs> I, I still deal with that one. You know what I'm talking How many people know the story? Yeah. yeah. Ha well, Joyce Myers, years ago, she was running off to the store and she was just ghost ride the shopping cart, you know, take off. And, and the Lord dealt with her. It's like somebody's going to have to chase that down, spend extra time because you, you're not going to be kind enough to push the shopping cart back. And it, it, it's, it's submission. You know what? Some of it's just called common courtesy nowadays. And so I, I had that dilemma. I was with somebody the other day, and I, uh, I was with Pastor Rod. He's not here tonight, but we were over at Home Depot. And I said, wait, i got to go push the shopping cart back. <laughs> I, I could have grossed for it. But I'm getting, I've gotten really good where I can push it across and, and, and sink, a, sink it. All right? How many people, you know what I mean? You, I'm good at it. I've kind of compromised where I ghostwrite it into the spot. It's a bit like golf. Yes, exactly. It's kind of like Frisbee golf. Second Chronicles. 7, 14 through 16. And, I like this, contingent. That's a contingent and. And my people who are called by my name, you're his righteous ones, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven 
will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Now my eyes shall be open and my place for now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name will be there forever and my eyes and heart will be there perpetually. Being in leadership, Yeshua house, I've been here. Every, every service I could be here. I don't know how many meals I've cooked. Seriously. We're in the 500 range on meals. I've bought over 400 bags of meatballs. And people have eaten them every week. But this here starts talking about who's his people, what they should do, how to do it, when to do it, what's going to happen, and his response to you when you repent has to happen. Pastor Pam and I, we had a, we had a conversation the other day about, she was at a, a, a church years ago, and there was a hellacious attack on the pastoral, you know. And you know what? When you get these kind of attacks in a transition, you have to expect the devil to show up. He does not want us to go next door. I saw it with the worship tonight. I, you know, I was like, David went. <laughs> I was like, okay, guys, we're going to worship. Kick the devil out of this place. And when we started praying, the heavens opened up. Praise God. But we have to realize how to pray. You cannot have that anger. You can't be in unforgiveness. You have to know what God's plan is, not what you want, what he wants. You have to forgive other people. That principle of forgiveness goes all across the board. And we have that, and having a prophetic ministry, I had a pastor years ago, I helped, I was invited to come to the church, I stayed there for about a year and a half, their church went from 60 people to over 200 people, and the Lord sent me to another church. And when I left that church, the place started falling down. And she started calling me up and blaming me. I go, no, 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 no. You don't, don't, you don't have to realize. You don't realize. God bless you. You're supposed to keep those people in there. And I told her, I go, I'm not going to play ghetto high with you. How many people know what ghetto high is? High school games from ghetto high. They, they were just, it's just stupid gossip, stupid things going on in the church. I said, no, 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 no. And she, she really attacked me publicly. She completely went after my reputation, everything about me. Even my dog. Don't touch my dog. And what I did, about two years later, she came back, apologized to me. She said, everything you've said about me, to me, for me, has always been 100% true. And she wanted me to pray for her again. And when you have a prophetic ministry, what do you do, pastor? You just pray for him. And so sometimes my skin is a little bit thick. I thank God for it. And sometimes my skin is too thick that I don't feel you're hurt. I'm sorry about that. I'm serious. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm serious. There's, there's, there's a point where, hey, you know what? We have prophetic ministries. We, we've, we've, speaking, we've spoken words over people. The Lord got me out of Mardell's. I mean, they, he supernaturally shut that place down. And I have more money in the bank now than I did while I was working. Oh. <laughs> and I made even more money today. I got a, a $15,000 phone call today. Praise God. <laughs> I am Jewish. You know, I got the hail damage on my house, and so I, the city has a program where you get free grant money for the city on your house. So you get 10% of the value of the house, so I get $20,000. I use my insurance money to fix the house and get my foundation. It's going to cost me out of pocket all that work, almost 20 plus thousand dollars, less than $5,000 out of my pocket. The million dollar question. You guys, you guys have to learn that. <laughs> Our wicked ways, we see this. The Lord just gave me the scripture. Let's go to James chapter 1. Here, you want to know your wicked ways? James chapter 1. 
Verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted. <laughs> so it can save your soul. You have to take the word of God, stick it in your heart, prove yourselves doer of the words, not just merely hearers of the word, who deluge themselves, for, which means deceives yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at the, um, looks at the his natural face in the mirror, and once he has looked at himself, has gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he is. You come to church on Sunday, you come Friday night, you read your Bible, and then you go home and you turn around. If you guys want to wear my shoes, right there they are. I didn't do that on purpose, but that, that worked out real good. We pray for you. We help you. But it's up to you to shift. It's, it's up to you to help protect the church. We're going into a growing season. I believe Yeshua House is going to see stuff supernatural. The attacks that we've been going through the last week and a half, two weeks, is just outrageous. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't comprehend the stuff we've gone through. And God has been faithful and he's broken through every time. James chapter 5, 16 through 20, says, Therefore, this is what I want you guys to do. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray the Shema tonight. A little bit different, Pastor Cook. We're going to do things a little bit different. We're, don't play it yet. I'll give you the clue. And it says, verse 16, Therefore, conf confess your sins to one another, Pray for one another so that you may be healed, that the effective prayer of a righteous person can be can accomplish much. This is a prophetic warning, but it's also a prophetic blessing for the end times. Because anytime you see Elijah, it's tied to end time breakthrough. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain and did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the skies poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and no one turns him back. I got head shaking. It takes a lot of fortitude to say to somebody, hey... You need to sit down and listen. You need to change your heart. Well, you don't know what they did. Or I'm special. Everybody's special nowadays. You get a little ribbon in school, you're special. Everybody has a special parking place. Verse 19 again. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, one, one turns him back. Let him know that he has turned back. A sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will recover a multitude of sins. When we, in love, talk to people, sometimes blue in the face, we talk and say, you know what? This is how a Christian person needs to do this. I've opened my home to many people. I've had uh, Wiley's house. How many? I don't know how many people live there. How many? Fifteen in the last seven years. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Daniel lives in my garage. Many languages. many languages. We have to share what we have for a reason. We have to get in the point where, hey, you know what? If somebody's going to invest in me, I'm going to sit there and listen to them. We don't have allegiance anymore to anything. The kids nowadays don't even do the Pledge of Allegiance in school. They stop doing that. Under God, oh, can't do that. But if they want to go to the Muslim mosque, that's fine. How am I going to get you guys to stand up and fight if I'm not standing up and fighting? But you've got to respect the fact that we all have to fight. We all have to stay in a repented stage of life where God can use us. I've dealt with many men who are completely hooked on pornography. It's just, it's just nasty. And uh, I was reading this pastor, uh, pastor in Korea posted a uh, thing about 
that pornography, how it keeps people from getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've got an entire generation of people who don't want to get married. How are we going to ever have Christian kids? The Muslims are, they got four or five wives. they got kids coming out their ears. We can't even get grandsons. Well, actually, Kimberly and I have five grandsons. <laughs> yes. yes. More to come. Amen. He was, in, James was talking about people sinning in church and in fellowship. He's not talking about running out in the street and going in the club. He's talking about people in the church in witchcraft playing little mind games. Oh, my culture doesn't do that. There's not, we, we've lost our Christian culture. We have to reestablish our Christian cultures and our standards that we have in our church. And that comes back to the leadership and the leader, people that are in leadership have to accept who we are in Christ, and they have to follow a set parameter. And any time you think I need to be corrected, you're allowed to do that. I know some people think that it's their daily mission. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> if there's something that needs to happen, please tell me. Did anybody catch what I just said? Some people try to correct me every day. Oh, you should be wearing that shirt. No, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, Pray. The Lord does direct our steps. And there's things that are going to happen in the next few months that are going to be kind of crazy in our country. And I'm, not, I, I, I'm telling you, we need to have a spirit of unity in the body of Christ to save our country. And we're a multicultural church. We got every nation. At one point, we had 13 different tongues in our culture here. 13 different languages. And we still see them cycle in here. But until we come in a unity, understand the headship, Christ himself, how he's established the body, how we're supposed to respond in every situation, we're going to have confusion. We're not going to see the breakthroughs. We're not going to understand, well, why did Pastor Carl do this or Pastor Pam do that? You know, why do they say I need to go through deliverance? <laughs> Look, you're dragging that big demon behind you all the time. I'm sick of it. <laughs> I, I'm trying to make light of it, but it's really serious. We're, our, our church is actually, we have very clean people in our church. But we're trying to establish, once we go over to the other side, we're in, it's going to be a little bit different setup. And please... Be flexible. Be teachable. Most people aren't great, grateful. That's the number one sign somebody's out of fellowship or in sin. If they're not grateful. Oh, I don't like meatballs. Okay. Be a vegetarian. I don't care. But we have to understand if you're not grateful, you're not grateful to who? Not me. God. He's trying to supply all your needs in, in His riches, His glory. And when the people don't want to respond in a positive way, and they just want to come, well, let's just go see what Yeshua house says. I need, a, I need prophecy, prayer. I'll come back in six weeks. We need to be a destination point where everybody gets trained, and they follow the rules, and they're teachable. If they don't want to be taught, that's a problem. I have people I'm accountable to, not only in this church, but above me. And I talk to them. And they know what's going on. And they know that we're, we're, we're the same prophecy keeps coming back that we're going to hit revival. And if we're not in unity, we're going to get slammed. And the people that are in sin, it's not they're in overt sin. I like that word too. Overt sin. Is that, is that a word? Yeah, I'm making that one up. Overt sin. <laughs> you know, well, you know, he's smoking, drinking, crack, whatever. No. Almost everything, when they're talking about sinners, these are conditions of the heart. Unforgiveness, unforgiveness, unforgiveness. And that stuff has to get out of your heart. First of all, if, if you don't get it out of your heart, and I'm talking to all the parents here, we got married people, parents here, until you do, your children are going to follow that curse. Hello? 
That's going to trickle down in some form or another. And we've talked about this with individuals in our church. They want a breakthrough. They want their kids to forgive them, but they won't forgive other people. Hello? It don't work that way. We need to forgive one another over and over. If you're going to be in Yeshua house, this is going to be our building within the next two years. I'm not planning on, uh, planning on waiting that long. We've, we just built out that, that place. We're in, that's, just our, that's just our temporary headquarters. That's our camp. Look what the Lord showed me. That 300, those are Gideon's men. Gideon's men. 300. Ah, not only the number is 300, the occupancy rate, that's Gideon's men. We got Gideon coming. You're all going to be drinking like dogs. <laughs> Gideon, they drink like dogs. <laughs> but we have to get in that form of repentance. And, and you know what? Um, and and, and, and I'm t I'm t am I teachable? Did I listen? Pastor? Pretty much? But you gotta, real, you gotta realize I'm still German and Jewish. I write you, yeah. But we want those breakthroughs to last. We're not going to have revival like John Wesleyan until we start praying. And we pray those sins of one another. You know, it's funny. Somebody could be a flat out crackhead alcoholic and be less attached to that to somebody who has a little greedy thing going on. Little sneaky thing going on. There's no, there's no comparison to sin. You can't compare sins. Oh, his sins are bigger than mine, so I must be great. It don't work that way. God's going to shift all of us into a new position, a new building, because he needs leadership on Sunday, because Sunday's going to be our big fishing day. We know this is the Sabbath. This is where the blessing comes in. But tonight... I want everybody, if you want, I'm just going to say, come up. We're going we're to do the Shema. It says, pray for one another. But you know what I want you to do? I want you to come here. If you got your tallies, put your tallies on. I don't want you touching somebody. I, I'm going to tell you why. Because the Lord showed me that he's going to touch people's hearts individually. And a lot of times, being prophetic... He will tell you to do something that's out of the norm. Okay? And so we're going to do the Shema. Israel was attacked this week. Did anybody notice that? Israel's attacked on Shavuot. Well, it's Ramadan, Don, Don, Don. Ramadan's a cult worship that goes back 2,000 years, 500 years before Muhammad. It's a sick thing. It has nothing to do with God. And so this tonight, I want you to guys come forward. Get your tall leads on. We're going to pray for Israel. I want you to ask God to forgive your heart. And I want you to, for, I, and I, I'm asking you to forgive me. If I've offended you, you, got, you guys have to understand, to be in leadership, I have to, I, I'm on a high wire all the time. And I'm still here for a reason. God put me here in leadership and establish Yeshua house for a reason. This is end time ministry and we have to wake up. And if you're not prepared, that's my fault. That means I didn't teach you. And I am teaching people every week something new that they can take home and use to protect themselves. I even bought more, more mace. I got more spray, pepper spray, if anybody needs pepper spray. Seriously. I want people to be protected. We care about people. And we don't harbor, you know, there are some people that are predators we don't let in here. But there are some wounded people we'll let back. I don't have, I don't have any, I don't have any, there's, I'm a, got the big old daddy's heart. I don't have any problem with that. And I'm not talking about anybody specific, but we have to come together in unity. And so tonight, as the last service in this building, we're going to come together in unity. And then we're going to pray. And then we're going to get in our circle and we're going to pray afterwards. Now we don't even have to do the circle. We're just going to come up here. I want everybody just, you know, if you got your tallies, come up to the altar. This is going to be a good old altar. Pastor Cook, after we're done with the 
Shema. Put some background music on. I want you guys to pray. Come up front and pray for Israel. Pray for our nation. Pray for the leadership, including me. And then also you need to forgive people in leadership. Because one of the things William, and, and uh, God bless William, it says when we pray, the sick will be healed. Praise God. Those things that are afflicting people will be broken off them. So we're going to turn, pray the Shema. What is the Shema? Hear and do. Shema Israel. Hear the word, do the word. That's what Shema means. We're going to be hearers of the doers of the word. That's what Pentecost is about. Doing the word of God. Following the word of God. So we're going to face Israel. We're going to do the Shema. Hashem. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed Hero Israel Hero Israel Lord, your God is one God. Everybody just repeat this. Say, Father God, I repent of all my sins, of my heart, my mouth, and my soul. I submit myself to the Word of God during this holiday weekend. I submit myself to the Holy Spirit that's within me. I submit myself to Christ, my, my Savior, I submit myself to the Father in Heaven. Father God, I repent for rebellion, for uh, undermining the authorities, for having a critical spirit, to being in sin for any area that I know of and I don't know of. Father God, make me a clean heart. Clean my heart 
Father God, I ask for forgiveness of everybody. I, I'm saying this to you guys. I ask for forgiveness of everybody in this building tonight. That they will know that I am here to serve them. That all that we do in ministry is to build the body. Father God, let them know in the spirit that we are battling for them on a daily basis. Father God, we want them to know that everything in the body of Christ is happening. And that we are going to follow your word regardless. Father God, that we're going to continue to protect the flock and forgive people. Father God, we ask that, I, I ask, Father, that these people know that the leadership is on your side. Tune into you only. And that all things that are evil be exposed. And that your righteousness be exalted over this group. As we trans transition into the new building, Father, that we leave that spirit of division behind. The spirit of undermining behind. The spirit of confusion behind. The spirit of attacking our worship behind. The spirit of procrastination behind. That the that spirit of racism be broken from trying to come back into our church. In the name of Yeshua. That there is a holy place for all people. That they will be respected and they will learn to follow your ways, Father. Let us be examples in every area in Yeshua's name. Amen. Praise God.